Hello everyone and welcome to Total War Through the Ages. In this episode, we shall continue on the Northern Offensive until we drive the Britons into the sea. So, starting off, we have a lot of kind of just campaign overview stuff, just kind of so everyone knows what's going on. Specifically, this is important for the battles later on that will be taking up a good chunk of this episode. So, this army right here which is, I really should start learning the names of the commanders, which I do plan to do uh, for the continuation of this series later on, but for the time being with Rome, I haven't done it so far, so I, I probably just won't just because, yeah, I'm lazy. But as we see, these are the two armies that are going to be advancing forward. Uh, that one obviously will go to capture the settlement directly north of it. Uh, I'm not sure what the name of it is. Yeah, I'll have to check the name of that settlement. And then we have this third army marching up through the Alps with the two scorpions that we have. And the reason I'm bringing the scorpions along is so that we don't actually have to wait a turn to besiege and capture the settlement. Because the scorpions will allow us to destroy, at the very least, the gates, if not the walls, assuming they're only palisades. They will also allow us to destroy the walls as, walls as well. Uh, allowing us to essentially capture a settlement right off the bat. So obviously I, I am aware that it does slow down the army, but the to me, I figure the flip side of being able to capture a settlement re, uh, without having to wait a turn, besieging it is actually pretty worth the slower pace of the army overall. Now I know obviously like if you did the math, it might come out to where it's not worth it, but just me personally, I wanted to try out the scorpions and see how they did. And so, yeah, those are the three armies that we're going to be focusing on in this episode. Kind of the westernmost, the center, and the and the eastern army. Or, I guess you could say, left, center, and right. So here, the center army is going to besiege this settlement here. Again, I'm not sure how to say the name on that. I will try and do some research. And meanwhile, the army over here on the our lefternmost flank uh, is... Pretty much, we did attack that army because I wanted to go ahead and cripple it, and then we're going to be pretty much proceeding directly to that settlement due north of its location. So here we have the first battle, which is the center army, and we got attacked by a pretty sizable force. Uh, the enemies, this is actually one of the f uh, first battles in a while that we've actually been attacked by a army that's... I think they may actually outnumber us, uh, or if they don't, it's very close. They're either as many or more guys than we do. Not by a lot, obviously, but just a slightly. So we're going to be moving into this battle, and this is actually one of the battles that I thought was very interesting. I actually really enjoyed this battle, uh, and I'm sure you'll see why. Yeah, so I just had to leave that line in there, the barking Mad Britons. I really like that uh, voice line. Uh, anyway, so on to the battle, we have the plateau here, which was where I was initially planning on deploying. However, I opted to deploy f as far forward as I could instead, kind of thinking I, you know, there's no reason to sit back and the plateau wouldn't be that big of an advantage for me. So initially I was going to, and you can tell by my deployment here, I deployed in two groups. I initially was going to have the right side group advance up and take the hill that's directly in front of me. And the group on the left was going to stretch between the road to the cliff face. And I was going to kind of deploy along there, as you, right there, that area that I'm looking at. So that was my initial plan. Now, I ended up changing this mainly just because of where the enemy army, the main army, uh, which is their one reinforcing the army that started on the field, consisted of only two units. So that wasn't really anything uh, difficult. So initially, I started kind of moving uh, over to the right a little bit because based off of where the reinforcing army was coming in from. And... A little bit later on, I actually just end up bringing all the forces up onto the hill instead of trying to leave any of them down. I also kind of figured it's probably not a great idea to split up my forces, so I wanted to, I decided to, again, consolidate them. Skipping ahead a little bit, we have here uh, the first couple units of infantry as well as my cavalry are coming in here. I went ahead and sent my cavalry a bit ahead. They're a little bit unsupported, not by a lot, but just slightly. And I wanted, to, I wanted to go ahead, though, and catch out those two units before the reinforcing army got any closer. I also begin to uh, start setting up the deployment of my the rightmost side of my force on the hill. And I was kind of looking here, and this is where I was looking there, and I decided that, you know what? I don't want to split my forces up. I want to just have everyone come to the hill. So I just start bringing the rest of the army around to that side. And at this point, the cavalry catch out the two enemy units, and then my infantry are able to catch up once they get caught out by the cavalry. And we're able to finish them off, no problem. 
At this point, I basically just start deploying my army on the hill. Uh, I have my two units of cavalry on the far right because I had the unit of barbarian cavalry on the far left actually off of the hill. And as you might notice there, the unit that unit of mercenary cavalry is actually routing because I didn't notice that they kind of got caught out. Uh, so I actually am not sure if they charged without orders or if I just had them too far up and I didn't notice and I forgot. I don't actually recall what happened there. But either way, they got caught out and they're now uh, they're now routing. And uh, as you can see here, I'm just kind of finishing the setting up my guys deploying on, on the to top of the hill here. Uh, and I have plenty of time to deploy before the enemy actually gets to me, so uh, that wasn't a big concern. And I also have legionaries and actually two Praetorian cohorts as well. So this is actually probably the uh, the ideal kind of setup for an army. Uh, obviously, if you had entirely made up of Praetorians, that'd be even better. But the flip side is the Praetorians are hard, are expensive and take a long time to train. So having you know kind of the backbone be legionary cohorts, a few units of auxilia as support, and then the two units of Praetorians. Obviously, the mercenaries were there just to kind of bolster our numbers. I would actually prefer in future to have those three units of uh, warband or the three warband unit of mercenaries. I don't recall exactly what their name, but I, I would actually prefer to have them be just more legionary cohorts. But Enough about my preferred army composition. Here where you saw me, I start sending one of the units of cavalry back to the left because at this point I finally do notice that my unit of, well actually not quite yet, but here in a moment I do notice my unit of mercenaries on, cavalry on the far left that kind of got caught out. So I finally, when I do notice them, I also notice, thankfully I did, I caught it, caught it in time, that the enemy had a unit of chariots coming around the left flank and they actually send that unit all the way around the hill. Uh, you can just see it there in the background. They send that unit of chariots once they finish off that unit of cavalry. Because, again, I wasn't paying attention. They got caught out again. So they got charged and then just pretty much routed instantly. Uh, so I am glad that I kind of shifted the one unit of cavalry back over to the left here. Because that unit of chariots on the far on my far left actually ends up coming around the hill and flanking and trying to flank me. Or it does flank me, but they don't do too well because I notice it. And here, this is very interesting. The enemy general, the, this big unit of chariots here, they actually just charge in without any infantry support. And I thought that was very strange. Obviously, the AI is... You know, can do some stu pretty stupid stuff, but it was just really interesting that the AI would do that because it's a really bad idea. They sure they charge in, but as you can see, I finish them off, and that was actually, in fact, the enemy, ru the fat enemy ruler, the Britain king. But either way, I, I'm not sure why they charge in there without infantry support. And then, of course, their infantry starts crashing on my right flank. I didn't actually even notice initially when they crashed on this right flank. As you can see, they're already uh, engaged with these chariots. But that one unit of infantry there charged my unit of legionaries and then routed. And I didn't even have to do anything. Uh, that is the beauty of legionaries is that they're so much better than just like the... Uh, swordsmen just the regular barbarian swordsmen uh they're so much they're so much better than those guys that honestly you don't have to do that much now when going up against chosen swordsmen which there are a few units of those mixed in the chosen swordsmen can give them a run for a run for their money so i i do need to pay attention still but as you can see, I pretty much route the entire right flank initially, and then just the route carries down along their center all the way over until this big group of guys started routing on the left flank. Uh, so at this point, it's pretty much just us chasing and running them down. So this battle is pretty much in reality over, as I said. It's mainly just running them down, trying to kill, kill as many as we can, inflict as many casualties so that they cannot have a force left to actually cause us any problems in the future. So... And the main thing here is that I was actually able to kill the faction leader, which was pretty big. Now, that doesn't, uh, game-wise, doesn't really ha have anything impact, but it's still fun. I always enjoy when I am able to kill one of the enemy enemy rulers. And here we have, here, you can see this is a tail end of the battle. I uh, left this in just to kind of show that I actually was able to chase down a good portion of the army, as you will see here in the end stats in just a moment. Here we go, and we can take a look at the instats. We killed a lot of guys. We had, I believe that was 1,200 or 1,300. Either way, uh, that this army, that was the one we just had the battle it with. Uh, immediately after that battle, we're able to turn around and ca capture this uh, settlement there that we were, were besieging. Meanwhile, we have the army with the two scorpions. We're going to move them up far, a little to the west here, and they're going to take the settlement directly north of the one we just captured. And then, of course, this army, even farther to the west, is going to be taking that one in the next two turns. Now, this was actually very interesting. Here we had uh, the Senate offices assigned, which I am kind of keeping track of the Senate stuff. Now, I was actually very particularly interested to see my popularity with the masses because obviously uh, a lot of people will probably know this. In order to 
march on Rome and declare yourself emperor, you have to have enough popularity with the masses before you can actually do that. That's uh, a big part of the game. Here we have, as I said, it's going to take me a turn to get the, ba the rams in place, but otherwise we're getting ready to capture that settlement. So, and, and again, one, one last time on the subject of the marching on Rome and declaring yourself emperor, that obviously is the overall goal of the campaign along with capturing 50 provinces but additionally at this point in the campaign i kind of started to think about that uh once i saw again it just kind of jogged my memory when i got the office and offices assigned so i a little bit here for the rest of this cam from this point on i should say in the campaign i kind of start to think a little bit ahead and kind of the very 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 early preliminary groundwork for uh kind of marching on rome declaring ourselves emperor and kind of the roman civil war however uh, before we have much time to, to th talk think about that, like I said, that's still a ways off. Uh, we do have this other battle going in here. Now, I wasn't sure if they outnumbered me, but I think these guys did outnumber me very slightly. Uh, either way, uh, I'm going to be moving into this battle, which is actually another pretty interesting one. For this battle, I actually did something kind of interesting. Now, I didn't know for sure if the enemy army was going to be deploying or, or the enemy reinforcing army was going to be behind us, but I was fairly confident. I was like, ah, based off of the way the cam it looked on the campaign map, I was fairly confident that they would actually be behind us. So I deployed my entire army at the back of my deployment, right where I guessed that the enemy army was going to be coming from, the reinforcements, and I was right. So I'm really happy about that. I did guess correctly, and there's the enemy army right in front of us. So at this point, I'm like, all right, here we go. Because and the reason I did this, just to clarify, is because uh, usually what I would do in this circumstance is I would focus on the enemy army that was started on the field, which is, for some reason, is always the smaller one, I find. you, it's The AI kind of makes that strange decision of attacking with the smaller army so that the big army comes in as reinforcements. I never really got that. Doesn't I don't think that would ever be really helpful. But usually, in previous battles, I have always focused on fighting the army that was already on the field, uh, especially if it was the smaller one, because I could just wipe it out and then focus on this one. Now, I did the I did the opposite this time because I was worried about losing too many guys against the small army, or the one that started on the field, to actually be able to fight these guys well, because uh, the army that started on the field, the smaller one, actually had some decent quality units, as did this one. I believe they have a few, several units of Chosen Swordsmen, as well as, I believe, the one that started on the field I know had at least one, I think, two chariots, and this army also had two units of chariots. And the chariots have... Now, I haven't had been having problems with chariots, really, but they have been caused... They do cause a decent number of casualties most of the time. Or not... A, they, they do... They are able to inflict... A, I don't know. I don't want to say decent. I don't know. They're able to inflict a substantial amount of casualties relative to how weak they seem. Like, they seem to be, like, I very rarely have that many problems beating chariots, but they do still inflict casualties. And because I did have to finish out the siege immediately after this battle, uh, I wasn't, I was hoping to obviously try and keep casualties down. Also because this army is made up almost entirely of actual full-on legionary cohorts, which are pretty hard for me to recruit in this region of the world. Uh, in fact, at this point, the only cities that I have that can recruit them are my capital, uh, Carthage, I believe, and then one other settlement, which I don't remember where. But either way, the point is, is that these, these units are really far away from where they can be recruited from, which of course means they cannot be replenished either. So... I am very much aware that, uh, and I actually think this is kind of cool because it kind of, in my mind, I kind of think of it as my supply lines are very stretched at this point. Uh, so I am currently working on getting, I believe, Narbo Martius is the settlement that I'm uh, currently working on getting the required buildings to be able to recruit uh, legionary cohorts. Now, of course, skipped ahead in the battle. This is us just turning around and complete bringing our entire force to bear against the army that started on the field. And as you can guess this is pretty straightforward very easy victory and we did continue the battle because i wanted to kill the general so i actually did continue the battle just for the soldiers because i hadn't killed the general yet and i wanted to kill him because if you kill the character the unit itself will just be gone and there's the results for that battle didn't lose too many guys there did lose a decent number but again not too many all things considered and of course we will have be finishing off the city in fact actually uh and also yeah we got besieged by the spanish that doesn't actually come into play. They break the siege later on. Uh, but, yeah, so we do go ahead and assault the city here and capture it. And that's a lot of progress made. Two cat, two settlements captured in two, in two episodes. That's pretty good, if I do say so myself. So, yeah, the Northern Offensive is going great. We're actually getting, uh, getting ready to hit, like, the pinnacle of the Northern 
offensive, uh, which I will, of course, point out when we actually get there, but we're very close to reaching that point. But that's all the time we have in this episode. So thank you all for watching. Be sure to check back for more Total War Theory of the Ages. And as always, till next time. Oh, I almost forgot. Yes, this settlement right here. Uh, that, that actually right there, we have the mission to capture that Spanish settlement, which will be launching the Iberian Offensive. Yeah, see, I'm going to come up with snazzy names for every like long-term goal in the campaign. But thanks for watching, and until next time.